Good afternoon and welcome to this Geary Forum. Basically today we're going to have some short presentation from members of our technology group and this will be followed by a panel of discussions on issues raised both in the talks and by your questions. On the housekeeping front, I'd like you to mute your microphone, microphones if you're not speaking, but remember to turn them back on if you're invited to put a question to the panel. And uh, as far as your videos are concerned, I'll leave that entirely up to you. Any questions as we go through, please use the chat box and I'll try to pick these up to put to the panel. And if you have any tech problems, well, as usual, the advice is to turn off and try again i.e. leave the meeting and rejoin us using the same link. Some of you might not be familiar with the WebEx platform we're on today. If you go to the layout button in the top left of your screen and select either stack or side by side, this gives you the view of the speakers. And if you have any questions, then please use the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> in order to give some focus to our panel discussion, we have some poll questions for you to respond to. And to find these, you go to the three dots in the bottom left of your screen and select the polling option. These questions will pop up once I finish speaking and with my introduction. So, um, Giri, just a few minutes on us because many of you may be familiar, but some less so. Giri was created back in 2015 following some research into uh, waste in the uh, on error in the construction industry and the results of that research showed that the direct cost that's the nearest thing you could get to the quantitative uh, part of this research was about five percent of gdp and there was a massive hidden cost in terms of indirect costs unrecorded process waste and latent defects as described here so um, we have Cliff, just sorry just to interrupt uh you're not sharing at the moment i'm not sure if you were um okay i'll sorry. just uh, check that okay yes that's better thanks so, as you can see here, the direct cost of uh, error 5% and the indirect cost at 7, unrecorded price waste 6, and latent defects 3, which gives us the 21%. Sorry about this, I'm just coping with that. <clears throat> now, so where does this error uh, occur? Our research showed that the top 10 root causes of error were in planning, design, culture, communication, and supervision. It's interesting that the skill of the operatives themselves didn't feature here. So let's look at quickly at Geary and how it's seeking to achieve its objective of error reduction and elimination and the benefit, benefits it brings. We have thought leadership through training, campaigns and forums such as this one and we have our research projects social media presence and general networking and the benefits that come from this are our key objective for productivity but what else comes along with that safety 37 percent of accidents in australia in the construction industry occur during rework Sustainability, we reduce our carbon footprint by taking waste out of our uh, operations through reducing error. There is clear quality benefits for getting things right. And if you are um, <clears throat> removing this error and not losing time and money, then our projects have more, far, far more predictable out outcomes, which leads us to a better reputation. The strategic aim of Geary is to improve construction productivity and quality and reduce cost and waste by eliminating error. And this remains our key uh, strategic aim today. Today's panel members, Melody Dawson, who is Director of Origin 7 and Chair of, the technology, of our technology group, Stefan Spear, 
Business Improvement Director for Construction at Morgan Sindel, Abhi Srivastava, who is Managing Director at Technobuilt, and Steve Green, who's Framework Bid Writer. So I'm now going to hand over to Melanie and uh, switch on the poll. Thanks very much. Okay, hopefully you can all hear me. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Geary Tech Group Forum today. So, by way of a quick introduction, I'm Melanie Dawson, and I've been responsible for leading the Tech Group for approximately the last um, six months or so. The, the main objectives of our group, the Geary Tech Group, um, are firstly to investigate innovative technology solutions that will help our industry to essentially get it right first time. Secondly, one of our core aims is around um, breaking down digital silos across functions to ensure that better quality data is delivered, which in turn helps to inform better quality decision making in the long run. And our third objective as a group um, is really around being here to support the application of the golden thread principles for a whole life approach to quality and error reduction um, supported by technology solutions. The theme of today's Geary Tech Forum is using technology to reduce errors and boost project success. So I will share with you a few examples of this in action from my perspective as a BIM and digital construction consultant. So I've been doing that for about the last year. Um, and before that, I have about 15 years previous experience, uh, mostly working on the main contractor side of things. So my first example um, looks at the power of technology at one of the, the simplest and I think often overlooked angles, and that is information management and essentially good document control, which is something all organizations should be looking at. Often the cause of errors um, is due to either out of date um, information out on site or in your offices. Um, and as a result, um, you have people working on information that's inaccurate or a not, not, not a good source essentially. Sometimes the problem is the lack of visibility. They simply don't have access to it or they can't find um, the digital data, even though they know it exists. So to reduce the errors and to boost the project success, there are three things um, that are required to optimize this type of technology, in my opinion. So firstly, a clearly defined set of project information standards so we can create the standardization that we need um, to improve what we're doing. We all know where to save um, we all need to know where to save a file, uh, how to name that file, how to name the inf information, and we all need to know um, how to find that. And that process essentially needs to be clearly documented. So for example, if somebody new was joining the team, um, they would be able to um, uh, join on. Secondly, people trained on um, on how to set up these the system um, and the interfaces, um, and the interfaces correctly are all very important um, to encourage end user engagement and to make sure that the people um, actually want to use the technology. <clears throat> and then finally, once you have identified the processes and the people, a technology platform to help automate um, all of these project requirements is really important. Um, as a consultant, I work on many BIM projects and um, the CDA or the common data environment is a critical piece um, that, that needs to be in this puzzle. This is often seen as a standalone piece of technology, um, a standalone solution and something that you need to buy uh, quite quickly. However, I probably personally think it's very important um, that it is seen as a process enabling tool that will allow the people working on the project to get better outcomes in the long term. And again, it's important that you choose the right technology to support those objectives. It really does take all three. It takes the people, the clearly defined processes, and then the selection of the right technology for your project and your project team. Another technology solution which has great potential <coughs> to reduce errors out on site is the software commonly used um, in the BIM environment. Uh, we would use it to perform clash detection and coordination on projects. This one really supports the get it right first time approach and allows the errors to be identified in the virtual world, corrected and then avoided in the real world. Again, for this type of technology to achieve its maximum potential, it requires buy in from right across the team and for good communication right from the outset, right from day, day one. 
detailed conversations around the setting out of information, the setting out of models, the software um, that's going to be used to ensure um, there's no issues with interoperability, for example, right down to identifying the key people responsible from each organization for providing that digital information um, from across the various teams to ensure that what we have is a complete virtual picture of that new asset. This upfront work and investment in clearly defined process, skilled people and compatible technology pays back in abundance then once the job hits site and you really start to reap the benefits. It gives greater cost certainty, program certainty and reduces errors on site uh, where it would potentially cause wasted time or materials or increased risk. Um, the third and final example for me then looks to the future and is where I think technology is really excelling and uh, presents huge opportunity. We talk about error avoidance at Geary, essentially predicting what, what could go wrong in advance and ensuring we avoid that path. I have noticed personally over the last um, few years in particular a definite shift in the focus for digital information and the technology that supports this. So I think originally the big focus was on ensuring good record keeping for audit, um, inspection or to manage risks on a project. But I think as an industry we have moved forward and more and more organisations have good quality structured data, partially as a result of the wider adoption of BIM but also partially through better understanding of the technology and the power it has if used correctly. More often I am seeing organisations use the technology and the structured data they have to not just um, you know, look in the rear view mirror, instead to look to the future, to predict the future and how to avoid making those errors that the uncertainty of not having a robust data set um, would typically bring. It's exciting to see organisations embrace artificial intelligence and machine learning, for example, and using this real-time data that they're capturing to form these future insights and it's definitely um, a tech, tech trend to watch for the future. This is ultimately a huge tool for supporting error avoidance and a progressive way, in my opinion, of making data-driven decisions to boost project success and often um, that spreads right across an organisation, which is great to see. So to sum up, it's technology underpinned by skilled people and processes like BIM, for example, that are key to the future success. So that's just a few of my thoughts. Um, Cliff, give me the thumbs up there. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass over to one of my colleagues on the Geary, Geary Tech Group. So it's um, Stefan and over to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Hello, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm Stefan. My role at Morgan Sindel Construction is that of Business Improvement Director, as mentioned by Cliff earlier. And I have a responsibility for operational efficiency, transparency of data and upskilling our operational teams. From a functional perspective, I lead planning and project management and our quality functions are pretty much our operations. Now, for me, getting the culture right on our project is absolutely crucial in order for us to improve the construction process and eliminate error. And I believe it can demonstrate that technology can help foster that culture. I don't believe anyone goes into work deliberately to do a bad job. People do want to do a good job. But to do it, they need the right information, the right plans, the right tools, the right skills to be able to complete the task that's required of them. And I believe tech can help here. Today, there's so much information available to everyone. It's difficult to know what the right information is and tech can help. Building information models, digital twins certainly help. But like everything, the information inputted into those models needs to be correct, complete and concise so that that accurate information can be presented to the people and teams needing it. At Morgan Sindel, we're implementing BIM Level 2 on pretty much all of our projects, written up execution plan standards in accordance with latest uh, ISO standards. And the use of BIM is definitely helping project teams avoid error. However, what I believe is making the biggest difference to the quality culture on our side is the tools that they use every day. We created at Morgan Sindel a bespoke digital project management system, we call it SIMS, and that provides us with the ability to share information, manage quality with the supply chain, our customers collaboratively across every project, ensuring that everything is designed specifically with that project in mind. We have a quality plan area which provides a digital check sheet for completion and identified specifically what's required for every plan, enabling the teams to select what trade requires a plan. For example, trades with low risk don't necessarily need a quality plan. But once the plan's completed, our tool enables us to design and share project-specific inspection and test plans for every work package and every work activity. 
and we've shared best practice ITPs and check sheets for over 60 work packages. And hopefully this is making lives for our project teams a little easier. It also maintains flexibility to allow all of the projects to be bespoke for the standards that are needed. And these ITPs are shared with ourselves, our supply chain and our customers again, and completed collaboratively through the technology that we've designed. It details what controls need to be witnessed, what needs to be tested, what hold points are needed, what samples are required and what benchmarks are needed. But absolutely crucially, every piece of relevant design information that's required, whether it be drawings, details or specs, can be accessed at the point of work or inspection, ensuring that relevant information is uh, there for each individual preventing us to trawl through thousands of documents and pieces of data that's produced on our projects today. And the system allows all of our records to be taken immediately, demonstrating compliance. So tests, photos, what work was done by who, who inspected it and when, can all be there automatically and included into our operating and maintenance files. In the future, all these records will be tagged against the uh, digital twin. But vitally, we measure our quality performance, and we have done so for years. It used to be practical completion and snag free, but we want to ensure that we're creating that quality culture. So back in 2018, we changed our measures to provide a quality project, which included that snag free building. But as part of that change, we change our measurements. And we introduce specific quality metrics for every project providing a unique project quality score. It was designed around the number of inspections carried out, number of defects raised and closed out within a time frame. But importantly, the more inspections and defects identified, the better the score. The more defects being identified was definitely an interesting concept. We debated it at length. We want to avoid defects and get our quality right first time. Time, but the creation of the mindset that a defect or error is a learning opportunity was the reason we decided to measure more defects as a positive perspective. Also ensured we were identifying any errors during the building phase rather than the end of the project or even worse, beyond completion. It's taken time, but year on year since the implementation of our metrics, we've seen improvement in our quality performance and our teams have demonstrated a real desire to beat their colleagues and whilst this competition wasn't designed or promoted deliberately, it was another positive outcome of implementing the measures. The measures are all taken from our technology and it enables us to understand where issues are arising, what trends we're seeing, so we can focus our, our attention to establish root cause of error. It also provides us with the ability to learn from those errors and provide uh, e-learning etc and stuff like that so that we can prevent it in the future the measures definitely would have been impossible without the use of technology that we designed and implemented so with the results of our quality performance year on year showing improvement we know that tech has improved the culture and performance of our project there's still improvements to be made with the technology but when we're asked can we have this on the system can we include this process we can only conclude that tech is helping and is wanted by our teams. I'd also say, whilst we built our own uh, system to manage quality, there's no right or wrong piece of tech out there. You just have to think about what you want to achieve and stick to that goal. Otherwise, you can be bogged down with offerings of technology solving problems you didn't even realise you'd had. So that's my take on it. I'm now going to pass you over to Abby. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Uh, I'm not. I'm trying to get the sharing up. Uh, just one second. You should have that now. Thank you, Helena. Is my video up? Yes, that's there now. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, good afternoon, um, everyone, and thank you, Steph, um, Melanie, and Cliff, who have gone before me. Um, I would like to talk, so my name is Abhi. I'm um, Managing Director of Technobuilt, um, which is 
involved heavily into digital transformation in the construction or uh, in capital project space using workflow automation and AI driven project delivery for construction and engineering and safety. Uh, before my work at Technobuilt, I was involved heavily in the machine learning in the financial sector, where I was uh, heading financial engineering for a leading city based firm, a fund where we were automating a lot of the trading decisions, automating risk management. And when I moved to the capital project space about four years back and being involved in uh, me, uh, in delivery of uh, mega projects out of Europe, uh, I was amazed by a, the, the lack of the adoption of technology within, uh, within our capital project space, but also amazed at the speed with which people are trying to solve problems and also the point solutions that a lot of um, organizations make to solve a particular need. I think if we continue building on that, that there's a lot of point solutions we do uh, good in terms of bringing efficiencies in a particular uh, department or a particular team's approach. But how do we go towards a more overall uh, digital adoption and uh, see how overall as an organization, uh, we can integrate all these point solutions and uh, have more connected workflows. As a Giri, you know, tech working group, we have been working on finding out what are the digital technologies that are used to, that can be used to reduce errors and provide new revenue streams and value producing opportunities. So it is much more than just the application of various technologies. It's also more than the process of converting analog information interactions and communications to digital. Digital engineering is likely to mix and combine a range of technologies such as, such as autonomous, semi-autonomous and manual operations with cloud, with sensor, with big data and 3D printing, uh, printing technologies open to unforeseen possibilities and create new engineering products, services and ecosystems. So at the Giri Tech Working Group, we did a study of what is the current adoption in the industry last year. And we categorized the technology that's available in various stages. So one is the digitally enabled design where you have the, we have the BIM solutions, the digital process solutions and the in design management. And then you have digital enabled procurement. Now within the digital enable procurement, you have the supply chain data analytics, uh, the solutions pertaining to that. Uh, there are things like upcoming technologies like blockchain and cloud computing, um, which by the way, um, a lot of the um, working group members felt that this is a technology that can facilitate contracts that enable collaboration and best practices on project management. Uh, we, uh, um, at Technobuild, we are also part of the CII's working group on blockchain for OS2, and we are er seeing early traction into um, kind of a multi-participant, multi-stakeholder, right from owner to tier one to subcontractor to supplier sort of participation in uh, using this particular technology, which is blockchain to enable effective and transparent contract management. So that's another something uh, area where technology enables uh, more efficiency and productivity. Then we have got the digital, digitally enabled manufacturing and sub-assembly. Now that is the MMC, the lean, the industry-based manufacture and robotics that is coming in within the, um, especially a lot um, in the, in, in, in UK. And we've got the digital, sorry. Uh, we've got the digital construction and smart sites. So after the process has been enabled right from the engineering to procurement, and then we've gone on site, there's numerous point solutions coming here like drones, uh, 3D printing, some automation on the site. And again, post COVID, the, access to sites remotely. There's good solutions, technology that are 
coming here, which can help us reduce errors or catch errors early. And like Stefan also mentioned, now as a result of having a full digital ecosystem, we can go towards a more uh, digital facility management and digital twin, the, the using sensors, using uh, GIS, the geoinformatics, the location, uh, and IOTs. Uh, now these, but the, we can see that these are the general categories where the technology focus has been of the solution uh, coming in the industry. And we can have a look at the uh, industry implementation rate has been kind of low to moderate to low. And these are changing post COVID. So one thing we understood that the approach is important. Uh, the technology itself on its own may not reduce error, but we can definitely use technology to reduce error if we have a proper understanding of which areas do we need to focus on. And, and the Giri study has been quite revealing that a lot of the errors has been through the process and right from the design communication to um, on the field. So the error has happened even before something has reached the field. So capturing errors early and uh, what are the, so this is a survey that was done um, within uh, the GIRI members. And there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, emphasis on which organizations want to focus on which areas of technology to help them uh, reduce errors. So I would, I would like to conclude that, you know, the adoption of technology is becoming quite critical uh, for us as even um, new components are supposed to come in with, we can't help stop uh, we can't help not mentioning the carbon uh, footprint and uh, new technology, new products coming in and the technology hopefully keeps us uh, uh, catching those errors early and help us uh, meet the quality requirements of our projects. Thanks. I'll pass on to Steve now uh, who will be sharing his thoughts. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Abby. Um... I've got a slightly different view. So I've been in the industry over 40 years, probably looking at technology over the last 20 years. So what I'm going to talk about is, is my opinion of, of three particular uh, aspects of technology. So we'll start with BIM. I was the BIM champion for Thomas Vail back in 2010, and we went on a field trip out to Finland. Uh, and I always remember one of the Finnish contractors saying to me, the trouble with you Brits are you, you're too conservative. You ought to just follow the Nike slogan and, and just do it. In terms of technology, just do it. If you don't do it, you'll never know whether it suits you or not. So here we are, we've done it, BIM, 10 years on. Um, what do we think? Well, certainly it prevents designs hitting site with inherent clashes. So we can do clash detection, we can find the clashes, but in terms of Giri, it's still gonna cost someone to redesign to overcome that clash. So it, it's not perfect yet. What it does do is, is force collaboration. And I think this designing in a federated space is, uh, is good. Um, it also helps clients visualize the end product. And I think we probably overcome late variations by the client being able to, to see what the finished product will, will look like. So uh, I think BIM can stop errors hitting site in terms of clashes. Um, but it probably won't reduce site errors because just because the BIM model's right, in my opinion, doesn't mean what we build is necessarily right. Um, but I think it can increase um, productivity by at least taking those initial clashes away from hitting site. So that was BIM. Secondly, I'm gonna talk about field-based applications. So this is the sort of thing that replaces clipboard and pen. Uh, and this is specifically, a, not marketing, but it, it was priority one, it's now field view. And this is a product that I introduced into Bouygues back in 2014. Um, and to be honest, though there was some initial resistance from the users, the fact that you could complete the forms in probably a 10th of the time it would take with a clipboard and pen meant it was very rapidly embraced. And the advantage was in terms of productivity, rather than doing site admin, it meant the site guys could be out on site or planning ahead and doing far more value adding tasks than just uh, filling forms in. I recall from both priority one and our perspective, and I think this is probably true of all technology, you have to be careful what you wish for because suddenly you're inundated with all this data 
and what am I going to do with it and how am I going to analyze it? So I think field-based technology can record errors and it's very good at managing their rectification. Um, it won't reduce design errors, um, but it certainly can free up productivity time. But it is an inspection tool. Uh, and I think someone far more famous than me said that you can't inspect quality into a product. It's either there or it's not. So all the tool is doing is recording what, what currently exists there. Now, finally, and hopefully uh, gluing together the first two, I'm going to touch upon knowledge management and specifically databases. Um, so when I was at Bouygues, I was the knowledge manager there for the UK. And Bouygues is a worldwide business, not surprisingly, had a knowledge management database and a number of forms that collected knowledge management. Um, but I always say to people, there's absolutely no point collecting data. There's absolutely no point collecting lessons learned. Unless you do something with it. And I think this is the key to, to knowledge management and the technology and digital technologies and, and how we can quickly um, record this information, but, but what do we do with it? So in Bouygues, we had this worldwide database, we had SharePoint sites stacked full of lessons learned, but unless you get people to use it, it's of limited benefit. So you, you need to put it into the, into the process, I think. Um, now, one specific thing that I'll, I'll finish on is videos. In terms of quality inspections, we found that we didn't know what good looked like. So I went out with one of our uh, post completion managers that was an ex bricklayer, and we did some 15, 20 second snippets of how to inspect brickwork, what a clean cavity should look like, what wall ties centers should be, how DPC should be lapped. And then we took these video snippets and linked them to the inspection sheet or the ITAP. So if you're going out to inspect brickwork, before you go, you can click the link and watch a short snappy video showing you what you need need to do before you go out in the field. Now, interestingly, our parent company at the time, Bouygues Batimon International, introduced something about eight months later called a High Five initiative, which was very similar. But the idea was that the guys on site would record the videos, no more than two minutes on how to install something, how to inspect something on a safe use of tool. But they had a slightly different idea. Rather than link it to the inspection sheet, they'd create a poster so I did a video for them of how to inspect fire doors. Uh, so you have a fire door poster and on the poster is a QR code. So if you're installing fire doors down a corridor, you put the poster up. Anyone installing the doors or even inspecting them or just walking by can scan the poster. And that links to the video that shows you how you should uh, install fire doors. So I, th I thought that was really useful. So I think the capturing of th this digital information has got real potential to reduce errors generally. Um, but it's how you embed it in the process. So collecting clashes from BIM, collecting the quality errors from field view and learning from them. That's the important bit. So uh, I think we, we can reduce site errors. We can improve productivity as long as the knowledge is re received by the, the user in the right format at the right time. And they don't always know when they need it. So I think the real challenge is knowing how you get that knowledge out to the uh, the user. And as Cliff's appeared, that means I should probably go quiet. So uh, I'm, hopefully that will trigger a debate shortly. So thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks guys and girls. Uh, that's uh, hopefully giving everyone some food for thought. Uh, we've also had the we've had the results of our polling, and uh, you, if you click the polling uh, link on the bottom of your screen, you can see what's uh, what's come up there. <clears throat> Do you feel technology can uh, reduce error? Well, the, the vast majority think it can, which is good. Um, I don't think that's a big surprise. Um, then there's the training one, and uh, no gets a big. What 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 do you think then, uh, panel? About the uh, perhaps if the panel could all turn their videos back on so we can see who we're talking to, that'd be good. 
if they haven't already. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so, Melanie, you're the chair of the tech group, so I'll pass it straight to you. Um, what do you think the issue is here then with the training? Uh, I mean, we've got all this technology, but the, the group think is that uh, there's not enough training in the technology and therefore perhaps potentially it's being either abused or misused. Yeah, I mean, I think it, training is a key a key part of making sure the technology works. I mean, and I, I know on a lot of the projects I've worked on, often technology is bought and the training doesn't follow quick enough um, and then the technology will fail. But I, I, I think a lot of the training that's out there isn't designed specifically for the users. So, for example, if you're a, a site manager, um, the, the training or the key aspects of a piece of software for you may be completely different to a document controller, for example. So I think there's probably not enough good training out there that is actually tailored to roles and uh, specific people's roles on a particular project. And I suppose often what you'll get is information overload in so much as uh, to learn how to use a piece of technology. It's a three day course away somewhere and out of those three days maybe two hours of that uh, training was actually relevant to you and your role so that puts people off and it probably doesn't give the impact that the training should really have um, or or you know you don't get the intended um, results I, I mean in, in my experience often what, what works well is if the organization buying the the piece of software or the technology actually invests in a training piece to go alongside that so again, a training piece that's tailored to suit their organization and the adoption of that piece of technology to suit the different uh, key roles uh, within that company. So I agree with the poll. Um, I don't think as an industry we invest enough in training um, in training our staff, but I also think we don't invest enough in making sure that that training is fit for those people as well. Okay, I think uh, Steve first going to... Uh, yes, yeah, if, if, I, if I could add to that, I think, um, yes, inevitably you need training from the supplier but i think that the long-term goal is trying to establish in-house training and a sort of champion and sort of peer-to-peer -peer training so if you're a site manager you're the champion you can train another site manager if you know you're a qs so i think that helps the the, the buy into the product and then it just grows grows from that but it, it it costs money it's not cheap but i think the investment's worthwhile stefan have you got a Something to say. Hi. That. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Cliff. Um, I've got a slightly different take on it. Um, if we need to train people to use the technology, I don't think the technology is right. Oh. It, it should be that intuitive that people can pick it up. I mean, um, great examples are with, with uh, our smartphone devices. The majority of apps that we get on the devices, even setting the phone up. We, we we don't get trained on that, generally speaking. Um, so to improve productivity, we've got to make things accessible and we've got to make things really simple. Um, and the sooner that we can get our, our technology, whatever the, the purpose of that technology is for, that it becomes so intuitive, people don't even realize the following a process, that's when we're gonna make life easier. Oh, interesting. Okay, Abby, what's your uh, what's your take on this issue? Yeah, I actually somewhat agree to Stefan uh, Stefan's uh, viewpoint here is that the technology itself needs to become and improve so that less and less training is required. We are uh, also seeing that at a front line that um, people are generally requesting for self paced training, where now everything's people are comfortable with remote working as well. So maybe the type of training, at least the content, if it's available in the right place with the right structure of training that is right for technology, that, that could be invested into. And um, and also, also one challenge I feel with training is that people change all the time. And we face this on many projects where we've trained someone and then someone's changed. So we need to enable, again, coming back to Sivan's point, it, it is a point where the lesser time for training or a self-paced would be very, very helpful. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. I can't see all these questions because uh, my screen won't show them. But um, I think the next one, question three, was: do you think, I've, all I've got is, do you think technology has? Um, can someone read the rest of that question? 
Yeah, a role to play in overcoming the current skill shortage. Right, okay. Well, there we, there we go. Skills shortage issue. So, um, Abby, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, actually, I can't see the question anymore. No, uh, it's to do with skill shortages and basically... Um, yeah, technology absolutely. Has a role. Uh, I think that, uh, I completely agree with the poll that a large majority thinks that technology has a major role to play. Um, there, there is a lot of, uh, we talked about workflow automation, and that is basically enabling one person to do a lot more easily in their daily time. And th that is sort of the skills we need. I mean, we are facing tremendous skills shortage uh, generally as an industry. And uh, how do we de-skill a job? Like uh, we, if you need a highly specialized training, then how do we make it a training a little lower level and have the technology overcome the um, a large scale delivery of that particular skill? So definitely agree with the poll here. Okay, so what's your thoughts on that, Stefan? Um, yeah. I I do believe technology can can help with with um, skills shortages to a certain degree. Um, I gi I'll give an example. Um, uh, Steve was mentioning about the videos included within various systems to show how things could be inspected, and a, and a video or a photograph we all know uh, um, provides a, a, a great deal of insight in, into things. Um, but actually getting the activity right itself, unless you're going down the, the route of robots and the like, um, I'm not so sure technology uh, can help get it right. Um, you know, I could watch many videos showing me how to put an IKEA um, uh, unit together, but I guarantee I still miss a bolt out somewhere. And uh, do you think that's the provision of information, or do you think that's your training in IKEA? That that's that that would be my, my own skill set. <laughs> <laughs> so, in order to uh, use the technology efficient effectively, we've not only got to train or not train people in the use of the technology, but actually in the task that they're doing as well. It's it's, a, it's an interesting yeah. combination. I know that most people most people on site probably have mobile phones and probably could access information i think designing build wiki um, that we talked about on a forum last year had the idea of giving access to the proper way of doing things and i think technology can help with that so melanie have you got any views on this yeah so um well i, I suppose i i think Te technology can automate a lot of the um, either repetitive or manual jobs that we have at the moment in construction. And I suppose the people who are currently doing those jobs, if um, it free, it would free them up then to do um, more highly skilled jobs or to transfer their skills to other things. Um, so I, I think technology definitely has its place, particularly with the um, kind of more repetitive or the more manual tasks. I also think that technology has the potential to attract people to the construction industry who perhaps wouldn't normally consider it as an industry for them. So I suppose there's a big surge in um, you know, uh, I suppose young graduates and people coming out of school, um, particularly around technology and um, you know, wanting to, to, to be more IT savvy. And I think in the construction industry with the emergence of new technologies, um, they're starting to actually look in, in that area as well because it can combine a few different things. So their, their passion perhaps for IT and technology and also for sort of creativity and um, producing outputs. So I think it, it, it can open a gateway to lots of different things, both to automation and removal of some of the manual tasks that perhaps we don't particularly uh, want to do, freeing up people's time to do some of the more highly skilled jobs um, that really do require sort of human intervention and the knowledge of people um, where, where the technology hasn't just caught up um, at the moment. Yeah, so we've got a question here on in the chat about the skills um, from Rob. 
while training civil engineers, QS project managers, et cetera, in digital skills is good and necessarily only goes so far. Do we need to invest in non-traditional construction skills like programs and data art architects and those soft skills um, that are necessary, ne becoming more and more necessary in construction because of all the uh, data and technology that's about? We've got uh, a lot more, a, a, a greater variety of people that need to be trained. And what do we think about that? What's your thoughts on that, Steve? Uh, it, it's an interesting one because I know at, at we just before I left, we'd, we'd employed a, I think it was called a data scientist. And I think it reflects what I was saying before that we've wished for all this data. We've got all this data, but, but how we, how do we interpret it? And I think we, <laughs> we have to be careful that we don't turn construction into a computer game we still need to build stuff and although the data is important and analyzing data can influence the future decisions we make i think in terms of this this question in terms of a skill shortage I, i'm not sure we'll be able to produce bricklayers and carpenters through some technological process so i'm not sure yeah i think uh i think you're right there, there is that um breadth of um, resource that perhaps we, we're only developing now in the industry. I don't think it's necessarily just game technology, but I, I know what you mean. You got any thoughts on that, Stefan? Um, I think it, Melanie's right in what she was saying, because there are technologies out there and, and, and you, you, you only have to go on YouTube and you can see things where uh, you've got robot brick layers and all, all kinds of stuff like that. And if you think about the automation um, and, and car manufacturing, the majority of, of um, their work is done by robots these days. Um, but when you get to the likes of uh, really complex and different kind of projections from brick lane, for example, a robot is very unlikely to be able to build a pier. Uh, for you, and in the same way, if you want a Rolls Royce, you, you, you're going to get uh, hand craftsmen doing that work. So uh, I think it's uh, a, a little bit horses for courses. Um, there, there, there is technology that will play a role in the future, and if we think about, gosh, what 2050 might look like, I, I guess it will look completely different to what we, we have today. But there will still be similarities today where we're talking about true craftsmen and, 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 and uh, people doing uh, the, the work, which is uh, a little bit more complex. Tech will have a, a role to play, I'm sure. Yeah, and uh, Ian, Ian's making the comment technology is an enabler and you still need to be competent and have the right behaviours in your role. And I, I think that's that's very true. And I think that goes to that point you were making. Um, one here from Jan that uh, in here, his experience, setting up training and deploying technology takes much more resource and, and time than is anticipated. A big effort up front and then it is easy to use and you get the benefits. I know from uh, when I was heavily involved in uh, design management that there were um, design management uh, programs that could be set up, but it took you to, you know, a couple of months to do them properly and nobody ever allowed you the time to do that. So, Abby, do you think there's enough upfront time in construction projects to get uh, things like the right technology solutions set up properly? Yeah, so th that's the thing with construction projects, you're always chasing a deadline. And uh, and when do you start a new technology is always an important decision for the project team. Uh, we frequently end up uh, engaging with um, uh, particular people who want to start the transformation journey, but then we have to pause it till because we got to wait till the next project comes. So there is definitely some merit to having the training and deployment done up front. However, I would also say that it should not be like the old school, maybe a decade ago, there were certain type of software or technology which used to take few years to really mature within an organization. 
and that's certainly not the speed that's going to be going forward. And the good part is that even within the last three years, there's so much, so many good uh, technology, uh, construction technology uh, companies that have come up, which are trying to solve these problems for the whole ecosystem. And by having an organization who can have a good roadmap, can engage as they feel in terms of uh, having uh, those particular um, players from the ecosystem help them in this journey. Um, Steve's got his hand up. Yeah, I, I know we said we couldn't do any advertising, but um, <laughs> I, I meant <laughs> Helena will cut me off now. Um, the, m my journey with the field base um, software was really interesting. And what we did in Constructing Excellence Midlands is we produced a guide. So if anyone goes onto the CE Midlands website, there's something there called a guide to the adoption of digital quality tools in construction. So that's the genuine lessons that we learn in going through the process and things to look for. And so CE Midlands website, publications, adoption of digital quality tools. Advert over. <laughs> well, uh, let's just go on to this uh, fourth question here, which uh, probably needs a bit, bit of explanation, if anything else. Do you know how you're going to capture the golden thread of digital information for your projects? Well, um, there was a, uh, a pretty balanced set of answers to that. So I have to say I struggled with, um, with that one. Um, this is all about digital information and data and how it's used from uh, the initial thinking about a project um, with a client and whether it's got the right business plan through to operation. So this is this golden thread in, in data. Um, Melanie, is that something that's uh, going to be um, a major issue for construction going forward, do you think? I think it probably has always been a major issue in so much as um, the industry is always very fragmented in terms of how we approach all of that information. So, you know, typically the, you know, the first stages sit in one pile and then we have the middle part of the project where it's on site, which is a separate budget and a separate team. And then you have the in use phase. So it's always quite fragmented. But I suppose one of the, the core principles really behind BIM um, underpins everything that, that the golden thread is aiming to do as well. So it's about creating information early at the start and then allowing that to build build the whole way through the project and then at the end you hand it over and that becomes a live piece of information that should be forever maintained but it does require you know the discussions with the end user with the operators you know on day one so it's as much about communication um, sharing goals and visions sharing budgets as well to make sure that we uh, incorporate everything but um, I think the, the golden thread is, is very important and I think um, you know BIM or suppose the structure that we have with BIM and the standards helps to underpin that at all of the different stages and, and connect that all together in a structured way. Right. Um, any have, have any of you other guys got a thought on this golden thread of data through the project? Abby? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting one how that I think the answer clearly shows that we're not very sure how we're going we're gonna to capture it. And uh, it is a really important question given the whole change in the environment towards sustainability. Uh, how do we even know what sustainable components we are using? Uh, and it's getting an important question to answer because 40% of the carbon footprint comes from construction and building. And the whole world, is planet rather, is going to be watching how construction and building industry evolves to come up to this challenge of sustainability. And uh, so capturing the definition of golden thread is itself going to evolve over time. We got to start somewhere and keep iterating uh, the capture um, of this. I think this is a solvable problem uh, if we all put our minds to it. Uh, but definitely this is one area which will be of keen interest uh, in the next coming years. Uh -huh. So just Coming on to the fifth question, uh, are there too many technologies uh, out there that appear to do the same thing? Um, I'm going to go to Stefan for this one. What do you think, Stefan? You're on mute, maybe. 
Apologies, sorry, I'm busy talking away there. Um, in in answer to the, the 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 question, there's always going to be a growth in 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 this area because people um, will will be looking to to sell us the world and that, and this latest piece of technology. As I mentioned in in my uh, talk, uh, are going to solve problems that we didn't even know we had. Um, uh, the amount of telephone calls that I will get every day from different people uh, um, suggesting that they've got a, a new piece of kit that, that's going to do uh, all of these wonderful things for us. Uh, um, I'd be very wealthy if I got a pound for every call that I had. Um, so, kind of, that's kind of answering the question somewhat that there is a lot of technology out there, but there's also a bit of so what about that because if you know what you want to be achieving and you stick to that goal whatever that objective might be then you can look at as much technology as you want yes you might pick the the the, the wrong tool initially but things can develop with time so so my recommendation would be ensure you know what goal you're after and just stick to that. And if anything comes along well, that's not going to be remotely, or, or you've got any doubt that it's not going to achieve that, then don't even look at it. Otherwise, you will get bogged down with all of the stuff that's out there. Yeah, I think uh, 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 on who is this? It's just said that Claire has just said it keeps the tech industry tech industry competitive and evolving. And I think that's always a good thing, isn't it? Um, we've got a, a minute or so left. Uh, Steve, do you want to just come in and uh, before I just close? Yeah, I, I was just going to wrap the two up, actually, five and six. I think one of the issues with too many different pieces of software, and I'm sure every contractor that's bought software knows this, it's the interoperability between what you've bought and does it talk to the other bits? And, you, you know, you end up with... 10 different pieces of software that you can't integrate for whatever reason. So that's, that's just the issue. Yeah. Thanks for that. You picked up the sixth question as well. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, we've got, uh, this inoperability issue. Uh, interestingly, the too many technologies question, 50% of the, uh, participants thought, uh, that yes, there's too much. Uh, and also uh, a, a large proportion saying that the it's the interoperability that's the issue. So that clearly there's an area for the industry to go at. Um, it's now two minutes to go, so I think we'll call it a day there. Thank you very much, um, to Melanie, Stefan, Abby, and S Steve for your input today. I hope that our participants found it interesting. Please. Uh, let us know at Geary if you've got any views on technology and we'll be very pleased to uh, absorb those within our thinking. Uh, Melanie will be taking the uh, tech group forward and I think that today will help to shape some of the uh, actions we'll be doing on that front as well. So thank you very much for joining us everyone and uh, we'll see you um, at some time in the future when we do another fireside chat with the tech group. Thanks very much.